Father in heaven, I thank you for this opportunity to be back in the pulpit today. But Lord, it's not about me. It's all about you. And so, Lord, I pray that I would decrease and that you would increase. I pray that you'd work through the preaching of your word for your glory. I pray for every mind to be attentive, for every ear to listen, for every heart to be receptive. And I pray that we would receive the word of God this morning as the word of God and not as a word of man. Help us to be humble, submissive, and obedient, and to consider others more important than ourselves. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, I'm sure you're ready to hear this, but open your Bibles this morning to Joshua chapter 21. I've been ready to say that for about three weeks now. Joshua chapter 21, as, we, we, uh, as you'll see, it won't be long, we'll be finishing up uh, this, the message through Joshua. And then I'm going to do a short series about the church, and then I'm going to go into a series on, uh, well, preparing us for uh, Reformation in October. But today, Joshua chapter 21, the title, God Never Fails. Uh, Let me just say that again, in case you need to hear it this morning. God never fails. Absolutely, absolutely never, ever does God fail. God never fails. And that's one of the things that we're going to learn this morning. And I promise you, in light of our world today and so much uncertainty, um, not knowing what to believe, what not to believe, not knowing who to trust, um, we need to remember that. We need to remember that our trust is in the Lord and that God's faithful and what He says comes to pass. And our days were ordained by God before we ever took a step. And God's faithful. And so I want to, uh, I don't know what your attitude may be coming in here today. What you may be thinking. Maybe you've got stress in your life. Maybe you've got worry, anxiety. Maybe you've got some sickness in your own home. And you just don't, you're struggling with how to pray and calm your emotions. And you're struggling for peace and the joy of the Lord. Well, I promise you, this morning's message is going to minister to you directly, and so I pray that you'll receive it. God never fails. It's an encouraging message. It's for believers, and my my purpose in this message is to help us to continue to trust in the unfailing character of God, to focus our mind's attention and our heart's affection on the Lord. I mean, there's just something about the beauty of God. Just something about the beauty of the Lord that just nourishes the soul and calms the spirit. There's something about the promises of God that just anchor us into what really matters. And so I pray that God does that this morning. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I am going to look at some select verses. Now before I read, let me just set the stage. God is continuing to distribute the land. He's brought the nation of Israel into the promised land. Many of the tribes have already received their inheritance. But now it's time for the Levites. It's time for them to receive their inheritance. What you're going to notice in this passage is the the Levites, who are the priests, they do not receive a region. That's not God's will for them. God does not give them a certain geographical area. Why? Because God himself is their inheritance. But what God does do is he gives them pasture land and he gives them cities. And so with that being in mind, let's look here, Joshua 21, verse 1. Then the heads of the fathers of the houses of the Levites came to Eleazar, the priest, and to Joshua, the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribes of the people of Israel. And they said to them, At Shiloh in the land of Canaan, the Lord commanded through Moses that we be given cities to dwell in along with pasture lands for our livestock. So by the command of the people of Israel, they gave the Levites the following cities and pasture lands out of their inheritance. Now notice what's happening here. Moses had promised the Israelites that they would receive cities and pasture lands. So now... The Levites are coming 
and they're asking for that inheritance. And according to the Scripture, what does the people do? The nation gives them their inheritance. Look at verse 8. These cities and their pasture lands, the people of Israel, gave by lot to the Levites as the Lord commanded through Moses. Once again, we see them receiving their inheritance. Now look at verse 41. This is important. Verse 41. The cities of the Levites in the midst of the possession of the people of Israel were in all 48 cities with their pasture lands. These cities each had its pasture lands around it. So it was with all the cities. Verse 43. Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers. Now that's important. The Lord gave to Israel not some of the land, not part of the land. The Bible says that the Lord gave to Israel all of the land that he swore to their fathers. And they took possession of it and they settled there. And the Lord gave them rest on every side just as he had sworn to their fathers. Notice what the Lord's doing. He said, I promised you a home, I've given you a home. I promised you rest, I'm giving you rest. He gave them rest on every side, just as he had swore to their fathers. Not one of all their enemies had withstood them, for the Lord had given all their enemies into their hands. Now notice verse 45. Not one Word. Some of you need to hear this this morning. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. What an encouragement. Everything that the Lord promised to the nation of Israel, He fulfilled. It all came to pass. Let me just say this morning, beloved, God always provides. God always takes care of his people. I promise you, Kelly and I have realized that in the past several weeks. Make no mistake about it. We love this church, I mean, so very much. And I think you all know how much we love you. I love being your pastor. I love, I love, I, I, I'm still amazed every day that the Lord allows me to pastor Edmonds First Baptist Church. I love all of you. You're family to me. I care about you deeply. And uh, I just don't say that. I mean that. I love our staff. Uh, just, just, but I'm going to tell you something. I just appreciate the way you, just, you have just reached out and cared for my family in the past several weeks. I mean, you've always cared for us. We've never questioned that. But just the way that you've, I mean, I've gotten all your cards, those of you who sent cards in the mail. I've gotten your text message. I've gotten emails. And yes, indeed, we got the food. Praise the Lord. I lost 20 pounds and then gained it all back. <laughs> Amen. But, you know, at the end of the day, that was the Lord taking care of us, wasn't it? I mean, God was using his people, but God was providing for our need. And this is something that God always does. I mean, this is something that Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, you remember what Christ said? Why worry? Look at the birds of the air. <laughs> they have nests. Why worry about what to wear or how you're clothed? Look at the lilies of the field. I mean, the Lord provides. He's never forsaken his people. And he never will. In Joshua chapter 20, God provided the cities of refuge. You remember that? For the manslayer who accidentally kills someone. And now we come to Joshua 21. And what does God do? God provides cities for the Levites in order for them too to have an inheritance. God provides for all of our needs. I know that if I could give each of you testimony this morning, you would declare that, wouldn't you? Just how faithful the Lord's been in your life. Well, I want to bring out three things from this passage. First of all is this. God provided by giving them a place to call home. God gave them a place to call home. 
We see that very clearly in this passage. The blessings of the Levite was that they became priests and they supported the tabernacle and later the temple. The Levites became God's select tribe. They led in worship. And by their actions and their position and by their calling, they were very unique. And as a result, God had something unique for them. He did not allow them to own lands, but God did give them cities. God gave them a home. And this is exactly what we see here at the beginning of chapter 21. The Levites come from Shiloh. They present their request to the panel that's responsible for granting the land. And sure enough, without hesitation, the Levites receive their, their request. But here's something that's important. God never intended, please hear what I'm about to say. God never intended for the land of Canaan to be the final home for his people. Do you remember what the author of Hebrews said about Abraham? Abraham, he was looking to a city whose architecture and builder is God. Make no mistake about it. God promised the, or God made the promise to Abraham concerning the promised land. But, but Abraham wasn't looking to the promised land. He was looking beyond the promised land. Not to a temporary home physically here on earth. But he was looking to his eternal home. Have you ever thought about this? That God has promised every Christian a brand new world. Let that sit in for a moment. A brand new world. And every word is what he fulfills. I was setting out yesterday. One of the things I've been doing is getting up in the morning and sitting on the front porch and eating a bowl of cereal, drink a cup of coffee. <clears throat> and I was sitting there and I was looking at our house and I was just sitting there thinking, you know, looking at the brick and mortar. And I was saying, hey, Lord, thank you for this home that you've given us. It is a home and we're so thankful for it. But then I eventually remembered, I mean, just in that moment, that wait a minute, you know, this is great, and it's t but it's temporary. This isn't what God has in store for me. God has a place for me, a place to call home. And it's a whole new world. I think about the things that happen in this world right now. People get sick, people die. Wars, rumors of wars, famine, pestilence, disease, violence uncertainties but the reality is this we have a whole new world coming and I don't you know I, I know it's our tendency because all we see what is right in front of us it's our tendency right now to only focus on this world we watch the news we watch the shows we listen to the uh, to the announcements and the next thing you know, we're confused and overwhelmed and don't know whether to sit down or stand up or go left or go right. And, and before long, we get outside of the will of God and, and uh, we start drifting away from the Lord. And then we start doing things that we thought we never would have done, acting in ways we thought we never would have acted. But what I want to encourage you to do this morning is realize that we have a place to call home. And it's a whole new world. Now, I was thinking about this, and I came across this, this example of the French Impressionist painter, Auguste Renoir. What little people don't know is that later in his life, he was confined to his home because he had severe arthritis in his hands. He had a, a friend, younger, much younger than him, as a matter of fact, 28 years younger, a man by the name of Henry Matassi. And he would come over and he would watch Renoir paint. And as Renoir was painting, he would literally cringe and, and, and agonize as, as he was barely able to hold the brush. And then his friend asked him, he said, Augusta, why do you paint when you're in such agony? Renoir responded, the pain passes, but the beauty remains. And as I think about this world that God's promised us, all this pain 
that we experience in this life, all this pain and agony that we go through, it passes. But the beauty of a whole new world remains. And just like God gave the Levites and the nation of Israel a place to call home, if you are a Christian, God has given you a place to call home. New heavens and a new earth, a whole new world. But not only has God given us a place to call home, God has given us a rest, a rest to enjoy. If we go back to verse 41, we see this. The cities of the Levites in the midst of the possession of the people, Israel, were in all 48 cities with their pasture lands. The cities each had its pasture lands around it, so it was with all these cities. Thus the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give their fathers. And they took possession of it, and they settled there. That's our promise. One day we're going to take possession of a whole new world. And listen, we are going to settle there. Isn't that good? Verse 44, and look here. And the Lord gave them rest on every side. Now, as we look further at the text, you can see that not only did God give them a place to call home, He gave them a rest to enjoy. We see that clearly in verse 44. Now, what does this rest mean? Does this mean that they had no more skirmishes? Not necessarily, because when you look at Judges chapter 1, we have a list of the Canaanites that continued to live in the land, and they continued to be a thorn in the flesh for the nation of Israel. But rest did mean, however, that the major hostilities, the major military campaigns were now over. The war had been won through pockets, even though there's pockets of resistance that remained. God brought his people in the land, and the major military battles were over. Now, when you look at the book of Joshua, the reality of their rest is really what encapsulates the book. God brought his people into the promised land in order to give them rest from their enemies. God wanted them to dwell peaceably and obediently in the land. Why? Because he's a merciful God, a compassionate God. Now, what we understand is this, is the reason they had rest from their enemies and the reason they had won the battle is because God fought for them. We see that in the walls of Jericho when they came came tumbling down and in other places. But here's the reality. Not only did God give them rest, God has given us rest. He's given us a rest to enjoy. For example, I don't know about you, but I know without a shadow of a doubt my sins are forgiven. Are you hearing me? I know that, I know without a shadow of a doubt My sins are forgiven. And I know that I am justified. That I am made right before God. Not because of anything that I've done, but because of what Christ has done upon my my behalf. And I have trusted in Him by grace, through faith, as my Lord and Savior. That's rest. To know, listen, to know no matter what I go through in this life, my sins are forgiven. What else matters, folks? <laughs> Think about it. I mean, really. What else really matters than to know that when you die, you're going to be with Jesus? Now, of course, we still are unsettled at times. Of course, we are still frantic at times. So the question is, is how do we tangibly, practically, Live out this rest that God has given us by faith. By faith. Every day we should wake up and we should say to ourselves, no matter what comes to me this day, I have a place to call home. And it's a whole new world. And no matter what I face today, I have a rest to enjoy. I know that my sins are forgiven and that Christ 
is a sure anchor. I'll tell you something, beloved. This is what our world needs to hear. We need to see Christians who stand and declare the sovereignty of God. Christians who will stand and declare that God is omnipotent, He's faithful, and He can be trusted in all things. It reminds me of a Sunday night service at the Marble Collegiate Church. Of course, it's a story I read. I wasn't there. In New York City, Bishop Leonard, he concluded his morning sermon, and he talked about the recent floods in John, John, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. A rumor had gone out that the newly built dam was giving way. So quickly, the people ran out of the church, filled with excitement and fear. Swiftly, they ran to get out of the valley. The architect who built the dam heard the news. He exclaimed to everyone, it's untrue. Then he jumps into his vehicle. He drives to the foot of the dam. He parks his truck. He gets out. He leaps from his car. And he exclaims to everyone, the dam will hold. It's not breaking. I know everything that has gone into it. I know all the material. The dam will hold. And I would say to you that this is the message that our world needs in this bewildered age in which we live. When everybody's running around and talking about COVID and scared about this and scared about that, what we need is for Christians to stand up and say, the dam will hold. Christ is sufficient. Christ is trustworthy. And I have a rest to enjoy in Him. And no matter what may come my way, my sins are forgiven. And I have a place to call home. Thirdly, we have a word to trust. We have a word to trust. Look at verse 45. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. Now this chapter concludes with a very powerful verse. I would submit to you that this is probably the major theme. Not only of this chapter, but perhaps even of the entire book. That what God says He'll do, He does. God was completely faithful to the nation of Israel. And not only for them, but throughout the ages, God has been faithful to His people. I remember when Solomon dedicated the temple. Solomon said this in 1 Kings 8, verse 56. He said, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to His people Israel according to all that He promised, which He spoke by His servant Moses. Isn't that good? Solomon said, he agrees right here. Solomon says the same thing. God has done according to all his promises. And God has given us a word to trust. Listen, and it's this inerrant, infallible, authoritative word of God. I mean, there's a battle going on in the world today of whether or not Christians are going to actually believe the Bible or not. I mean, let me ask you, do you actually believe the Bible? I mean, I hope so. I mean, do you believe what the Bible teaches you about God's sovereignty? God's providence? God's faithfulness? And God's trustworthiness? I mean, do you believe that God's in control or not? I mean, do you believe that 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 I mean, that God provides, and He's not going to leave you in want. So I want to encourage you. God's given us a word to trust. So will you embrace these promises today? And what are they? That God's given you a place to call home. It's a whole new world. God's given you a rest to enjoy. That no matter what may come your way, your sins are forgiven. And God's given you a word to trust. And what is that? That everything that He's promised you will come to pass. Will come to pass. 
So here's my prayer for you this morning, Edmonds First Baptist. My prayer for you is that you wake up every day and you say that no matter what comes my way, I've got a place to call home. That no matter what comes my way, I have a rest to enjoy. My sins are forgiven. And that no matter what comes my way, I have a word from God I can trust in. And I think that you'll find your perspective of life and life situations and the peace that you have in your heart start looking a lot different. These are the things that the Lord has taught me. And my prayer is that these be the things that He teaches you. Now, a lot can be said about these things, rest, home, a word. But, but how do we receive this inheritance? How do, how do we receive this place to call home? How do we receive, where is this, where is this rest to enjoy found? Where is this word to trust? It's found in a person. His name is Jesus Christ. You will, listen, the only way to have a whole new world as your home is to know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. The only way to have rest, to know that your sins are forgiven, is to trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. The only way that you have a sure word that you can trust is that you come to know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And I have no doubt that there are people in here this morning who know a lot about Christ, but perhaps you don't know Christ. And my prayer this morning is that you'll renounce pride, and that you'll, and that you listen, that you'll simply surrender your life to Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It's the most important decision that you'll ever make in life uh, uh, is concerning what you're going to do with Jesus. Either you're going to turn from sin and surrender to Him and live your life for Him, or you're going to continue going your own way, doing your own thing. And listen, if you choose that path, you will not have a place to call home. And you do not have a rest to enjoy. And you do not have a word to trust. You're lost. So come to Christ today, if you have not, and be saved. I want to ask if you would to bow your heads this morning as we enter into this time of personal reflection and response. I want to go ahead and ask our pastors to make their way forward. We'll be up here to greet you. Here in a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand. And for those of you who are in need of salvation, and you know who you are, when I ask you to stand, would you come? Walk up to us. Let us pray with you. Let us encourage you. Others of you this morning, maybe you just want to find a place here at the altar and just thank the Lord. Say, Lord, thank you for my place to call home. Thank you for the rest that you've given me to enjoy. Thank you for the sure word that you've given me to trust. Help me to wake up every day reminding myself of those things. Maybe you're looking for a church home, a place to belong, a place where you can be loved and served, exercise your spiritual gifts, a place where you can trust that the Word of God is going to be preached every week. Then please come and join our fellowship during this time. Father, we commit this time to you. May all things be done for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand and come now as the Lord leads?